Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Rangavikramarachi, and myself, I warmly welcome you to the second day of the Sri Lanka Surgical Congress 22. We have an exciting session uh, as the first session today, the best six research papers being presented by our trainees. And uh, this session will be in honor of our benefactors, Dr. Noel and Nora Bartholomews, and uh, our eminent panel of judges will comprise of, from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, we have the immediate vice president, uh, the immediate president, Professor Mike Griffin, and the incumbent president, Professor Rowan Parks, and uh, Dr. Andrudha Abhigunasekara from Sri Lanka will be our uh, elite panel of judges. Uh, I invite the first speaker, Dr. B. S. Sikure, and uh, I will uh, advise the speakers that you are allocated six minutes to speak on the subject and two minutes for the pertinent questions. So I invite Dr. B. S. Sikure to de deliver the first. Uh, presentation. Okay, uh, we'll uh, first of all move on to the uh, second paper then, uh, OP5, Dr. P. S. Alas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Prasangika Senavirat Nailas. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Our research title is, is Brief Psychological Intervention Effective in Reducing Psychological Distress Among Cancer Patients. It's a randomized controlled trial done at Columbus South Teaching Hospital. Background is that cancers are the second leading cause of death, accounts for one in fifth death. And studies have shown receiving a diagnosis of cancer is amount to have uh, receiving a death sentence perceived by more than two thirds of the patients. And one third of the patients are avoiding cancer care, which is detrimental. Psychological distress varied from 40 to 80 percent, depending on the stage and depending on the type of cancers. No formal assessment of distress of the, or the interventions done in Sri Lanka. So our aim was to apply and assess the effectiveness of a brief psychological intervention and to assess the patient's perception about it. So this is how we enroll the patients uh, into uh, control and the intervention. And our sa target sample size was 37. To get that, we have to enroll 153 first newly diagnosed cancer patients. Sorry, it, it's a, uh, so methodologies, it's a single blind, uh, single blinded randomized control trial. So we use newly diagnosed patient of any type of cancer who are having a surgical options prior to anything, age between 18 and 65. And the exclusion criteria were like having psychiatric illness, having disability, physical or mental disability, undergoing any form of a treatment to have a unique two uh, categories uh, to reduce the confounding variables. So the data was collected by inf uh, interviewer uh, assessed questionnaire, demographic data, and the data related to worries and fears and coping methods and the attitudes were used. We use hospital anxiety depression scale, which is validated in Sri Lanka in all three languages, and SPS is used, and it was registered under clinical trial before doing this. So this is our intervention. So first of all, the patients, when they confirm their diagnosis and breaking of bad news, uh, usually after one week, they get registered in a separate clinic to arrange surgical procedures. So we got them down there and assess with head scale and offer the intervention. Other, pa other patient control group received the routine care. The uh, intervention includes this. It's a four hour total uh, time, and education on cancer, acknowledging the distress. That was done by the surgical registrar. Usually it takes about 30 minutes. And deep muscle relaxation training also introduced to them and uh, make sure that they are confident uh, about it. And then we did problem solving counseling. That uh, lasts usually about one hour. And we assure that the patients are following this by 
um, asking maintaining of the diary. And the session two uh, was uh, having the continuation of the first session and the brief assessment of the diary maintenance. And we looked at the other uh, emerging psychiatric problems because to exclude them from the study. These are the results. So the profile of the sample doesn't show any significant difference between the uh, age, sex, partnership, employment, income, uh, family uh, support, cancer category or uh, cancer category or spread. So uh, this is their worries and the coping strategies. So that also doesn't show much significant, doesn't show any significant difference. Then we assess the baseline anxiety and depression. Separately, you can assess it the head score. And the intervention group and the control group uh, doesn't show significant difference at the baseline. But after post-intervention group, only the anxiety group has low anxiety levels, which is significant. And when we calculated NNT came as 7. But depression has not changed. Then we assess the perception about this intervention uh, about the cancer patients. So the knowledge, care, and the feeling of well-being was uh, statistically significant in the intervention group in comparison to the control group. So uh, our conclusion is this is a brief psychological intervention we could have done in a surgical setting because the surgical, uh, the waiting period is usually not uh, beyond six weeks. So this intervention, if we, we thought if we start at the beginning, it would be benefit to these patients in long run how to cope their solve their problems and cope with these different uh, methods that they are going to uh, face in the future. So the contamination could have happened, so that was a limitation, and we couldn't uh, do it with the stages of cancer because it will take a long time to find the identical uh, sample size. And the re uh, recommendations are we need more studies on different types of cancers and different stages of cancers, and we have to see the long-term outcome as well uh, in long run, assessing the quality of life. And we need studies on feasibility of psychological intervention, and I would like to acknowledge all the patients who have participated to this study. Thank you. I will go through on the last slide. So the conclusions are brief psychological intervention is significantly effective in reducing anxiety among newly diagnosed cancer patients. Uh, with the length of the waiting period in our cancer patients in Columbus South Teaching Hospital, this was the more uh, effective uh, treatment that we could have designed. And the contamination may have happened, and it's a limitation. And we didn't consider the stages of cancers, but we have excluded uh, <clears throat> the patients who have not gone through any uh, procedures. And we recommend we need, need more studies in different types of cancers and different stages of cancers, and need to check the long-term outcome. Whether if we start at the beginning, whether they will go through the process smoothly. And uh, I would like to acknowledge all the patients who participated in this study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alice. Uh, there are some questions from the panel. Uh, if you can have the mic. Thank you for your presentation. Um, could you just clarify whether the psychiatrist was one and the same for all of the uh, patients, or was it a different psychiatrist that that um, that did the interviews? And secondly, can you confirm whether major cancers that required um, significant intervention were uh, equally distributed between the two groups? If you can use the mic, Sorry. thank you. The intervention was done by a, uh, another psychiatrist, and uh, it's, uh, another psychiatrist was involved in this study. And the uh, equally distribution was checked with the McNamara test. Uh, checking whether it is uh, whether it is uh, incidental finding, because the anxiety was uh, significantly reduced, so we use a McNamara test to check whether it's an uh, incidental finding or whether the truly it has come down. And just another question related to the same. Now you said all the patients opted for surgery. Can I just find out they are the curative surgery or the palliative surgery? Probably would have had an impact on the outcome. 
Yes, we didn't take palliative surgery. It's the first time diagnosed patients who are having some sort of a curative surgery before other procedures. Uh, congratulations, uh, very nicely presented and well done on running a randomized trial um, with you. significant interventions. C can I ask, did you do a power calculation for how many patients you'd need to enroll to see a significant effect? Significant uh, effect. Effect. Did you do a power calculation? No, we didn't do power calculation, but we calculated in a number need to treat. It came as seven. Okay, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Alice. Thank you very much. And uh, we will move on to the next presentation, oral presentation 26, uh, which will be presented by Dr. D. H. J. P. U. Lakshani. Lakshani. Good morning, everyone. I am Uresha Lakshani. I am from the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, Ragama. Uh, let me introduce our study, the intraoperative visualization of biliary anatomy using endosanine clean fluorescence in a Sri Lankan patient cohort. As you all know, the Baldock injury due to the laparoscopic cholecystectomy results in a high morbidity, mortality, and a poor overall quality of life. So, endosanine clean fluorescence cholangiography has shown to improve the intraoperative visualization of the biliary tree, reducing the risk of injury. This technique is usually is non invasive when we compare it with the standard cholangiogram, and it has been proven to be safe. So we conducted a prospective cohort study, and it includes 121 consecutive patients who underwent laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the visualization of the specific anatomical landmarks, uh, such as cystic duct, cystic duct, common bile duct junction, common bile duct, common hepatic duct, and the right and the left hepatic duct were recorded pre and post dissection of the callus triangle with and without the ICG fluorescence. Whereas there, we administered 5 mg of ICG intravenously at induction, and as the visualization mode, we used the strike of 1588 laparoscope with a near infrared mode. So, for that, we took the ethical clearance from the RC Faculty of Medicine, University of Catania, as well. Um, as a result of our study, uh, According to the results of our cohort, the median age is 40 42 years in a range of 18 to 82, and 64.5% uh, were the females. And the majority who underwent the laparoscopic cholecystectomy were due to the biliary colic, and it's about 69%, and the 21% was due to the acute cholecystitis. And so here you can see a graph. Uh, showing uh, in each part of the biliary tract visualization, the before dissection of the callus triangle, uh, is the blue bars indicate the without the IC, visualization without the ICG fluorescence, and the red bars indicate the is visualization with the ICG fluorescence. So uh, here you can clearly see the cystic duct and comet viaduct duct junction was visualization improved from the 6% to 87% uh, with the ICG fluorescence and the CBD from 33% uh, to 87%, and the CHD from the 14% to 66%. So here is the uh, this how the cystic duct and the common bile duct, uh, common hepatic duct visualization is enhanced with the ICG fluorescence actually. So this is the result of the after dissection of the callus triangle. Uh, it's usually uh, became 100% visualization of the cystic duct, cystic duct and cyst common bile duct junction, common bile duct, duct with the ICG fluorescence. So in here also, the cystic duct common bile junction, which is the which is an important landmark to reduce the bile duct injury, was increased from 53% to 100% with the ICG fluorescence. Actually, in, the, in these two occasions, uh, right hepatic duct and the left hepatic duct was only visualized with the ICG fluorescence. So this is how the uh, critical of safety we was enhanced with the ICG fluorescence. Actually, it's not only the cystic duct, but also the cystic artery. Also, we can visualize with the, uh, on, on real-time administration of the ICG. Um, as a summary, when you take the, the percentage of the patients who visualize the entire extrahepatic biliary tract, which includes the cystic duct, common bile duct, and the common hepatic duct, was increased from 4.1% to 7.1% uh, with the ICG fluorescence before dissection and from 15.7% to 91.7% after dissection with the ICG fluorescence. So luckily none of our patients reported, not reported adverse effects of the ICG or bile duct injuries. 
So, as a conclusion, we can say the intraoperative use of ICG is safe and it significantly enhances the visualization of landmarks in the bidyary anatomy and also it may help to prevent uh, by duct injury during laparoscopic or cystectomy and its routine use of may be considered in the local setting as well. So, but finally, and most importantly, I would want to say, the study does not provide any evidence that ICG persons reduce the bile duct injury, because it will require a large control trial, uh, large randomized control trial with a large sample. So we suggest, but we suggest to improve visualization can prevent inadvertent injury. So if you see, you will free from a danger. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lakshani. Now the paper is open for discussion. Very uh, clear presentation again, very interesting topic um, and I think your conclusion was absolutely right. Um, this won't necessarily prevent bile duct injury because it's all about interpretation. It's interpretation of what you're seeing uh, and so I, I guess one of the questions I would have is how did you determine the difference between what is perceived as a cystic duct or what could be a low insertion of a right posterior sectoral duct. So how do you interpret what you think might be a cystic duct, common bile duct junction, where it could be in fact aberrant um, anatomy such as a low insertion of a posterior sectoral duct? Uh, yes, uh, we, uh, like, uh, we took the like, consecutive patients of 121. Uh, but we actually didn't find any aberrant anatomy like uh, the pictures. We focused on these areas to uh, to like, take the percentage differences with the, without the ICG fluorescence and with ICG fluorescence, and we actually uh, took those areas only so in the cystic duct, cystic duct, common bile duct junction, common bile duct, common hepatic duct, like and right and left hepatic duct. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. And once again, thank you for a clear presentation. It was uh, very interesting um, of this new technique. Um, who was responsible for interpreting the, um, the, the, the angiograms, the cholangiograms that you got? Was that the operating surgeon? Or did you have um, a radiologist in the room? Or who, who did the interpretation of those pictures following on from what Professor Parks asked you? Surgeons, uh, Just the operating surgeon? Uh, yes. Right, okay. And how much does it cost to do this procedure? Uh, yes, okay, thank you, sir. Because uh, actually, the one vial costs about 15,000. So uh, it, it includes a 25 milligram. So actually, in the, within the day, we can use for five patients within one vial. So actually, that's the cost for them. Uh, like, so. And how long? Just to follow on for that, how long, how much longer did the laparoscopic cholecystectomy take whilst you interpreted this information? Uh, <coughs> actually, sir, it's take usually from 30 minutes to up to three hours. We can visualize the uh, biliary tract the anatomy. So we usually induction uh, before the 20 minutes of induction, we gale, and then uh, we can visualize because it usually lasts from the uh, 30 minutes to three hours period. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lakshani. We will move on to the next one. I call upon uh, Dr. Vino Prasad Shivakumar, President of OP29, to address the audience. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vino Prasad Shivakumar from Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. And today I'm presenting a paper on clinical teaching and its effects on medical students' performance in student-centered learning environment. So uh, in introduction, effective clinical teaching is the core of medical education, and maintaining it in a hectic and pressurized healthcare setting raises a challenge. And the time devoted to medical student education is also declining. And additionally, Different attitudes of teachers and their clinical responsibilities has its own influence on medical students' education. So our study is a descriptive cross-sectional study, and it was conducted between August 2021 to August 2022. 
uh, 50 students completed their professori professorial surgery appointment, were recruited, and we use uh, self-administered voluntary anonymous questionnaire to do this research. The data we collected included basic demographic details and uh, ca past academic records and their level of confidence in performing some basic ward procedures and perception on teachers' contribution. The analysis was done using SPSS version 22. So the results, uh, 182 students were recruited and the majority of them were males. And when we analyzed the first, uh, first year exam, uh, most of the students, nearly 33% of the students were, had uh, passed uh, in the first attempt. And around 13% uh, of the students has the best result, that is the first class. And at the end of fourth year, we have another uh, important exam called Applied Science Stream Exam. So in that exam, around 33% of the students had passed, and they only around 16% uh, of the students had best results. That's first class. So uh, and we analyzed uh, medical students' perception on uh, the education by university staff versus and non-university staff so, uh, from the scale of strongly agree to uh, strongly disagree. Uh, so university staff includes professors and consultants attached to the uh, professor unit, and the non-university staff includes registrars and senior registrars as well as house officers work in the ward. So the bars that are colored lighter includes, uh, uh, shows the university staff, and the bars that are colored, uh, colored darker include, uh, shows non-university staff. As you can see, in learning climate, Students have said like 57% of the students have agreed and 12% of students strongly agreed that the non-university staff behaves more respectfully towards the students than the university staff where only 33% of the students agreed and 5.5% of students strongly agreed. And the same pattern we observed in terms of commending students' contribution and giving feedbacks in ward-related work. And when it comes to clinical teaching as well, uh, 67% of the students agreed and 11% of students strongly agreed that non-university staff teach more about physical examination finding. Compared to the uh, university staff, they, uh, only 57% agreed and 10% strongly agreed, which is lower than the response that, was, that students gave to non-university staff. And the same pattern you can observe uh, for uh, when giving practical skills training as well as clinical reasoning of the symptoms and signs and enhancing interest in the subject as well. And similarly, uh, when, com when it comes to preparation for teaching, again, uh, students, most of the students uh, agreed, uh, uh, around 58% of the students agreed and 9% of the students strongly agreed that non-university staff, they are, they are in their way of teaching is pitched to student level than the university staff, because the university staff received only 47% agreed and 7.1% students strongly agreed with university staff. And the same pattern you can observe for being the content appro appropriate and congruency of the uh, objectives and content covered during the award round. So when it comes to the uh, mean level of contribution, we, uh, we ask the students to gray, uh, give a uh, response from one to five. Uh, so the mean level of contributions consultants received was 3.049, which is the highest. However, the, the mean level of contributions received by senior registrar and registrar was on par with consultant, because there's no big difference. And uh, finally, we asked about the uh, confidence level of performing some basic clinical skills in the ward. And the students had highest level of uh, Confidence in performing very simple works such as filling request forms where they have uh, had a mean level of 4.13 and uh, maintaining temperature chart, which is uh, the mean level they had was 4.08. And uh, more tricky uh, tasks such as ET tube intubation, uh, they only had, I mean, uh, the mean level of confidence the students had was 2.3, uh, whereas for suturing wood it was 2.7. So in discussion, as I've explained before, uh, highest level of confidence was seen for filling request forms, and the lowest level was seen for ET tube intubation. And non-faculty staff had more contribution to teaching than the academic staff. 
no significant association was seen between the grades in the first and the fourth year with the level of confidence in the ward procedures. So in conclusion, academic staff received, uh, medical students received good quality of clinical education from both university and non-university staff, but the non-university staff played more role, and uh, the students' confidence in performing some skilled procedures needs further improvement. Thank you. Uh, the paper is open for discussion and any questions. Professor Parks. Yeah, congratulations and very nicely presented, nice slides. I guess your findings, if it was repeated in the UK, I suspect would be very similar. It's the more junior members of staff that are often highly involved in teaching at a ward level. But I guess the aspect of your study that you're really drawing out at the end was about their confidence in practical yes. skills. Is there any simulation teaching for some of these topics where they can actually build up their confidence, where they mightn't have the opportunity to see as many endotracheal intubations in a practical level with patients? Can they, do they have access to simulation and would that change the results if, if that was encouraged as a method of education? Uh, so usually during our final year uh, education, uh, the, you, uh, before the final year education, we have some simulation tasks such as wound suturing and all. But uh, during the uh, final year, like uh, students can perform these uh, uh, ET tube intubations and so on under supervision, especially during the theater days, like uh, they can perform. However, uh, if it is done to every student as a compulsory task, I think uh, students, uh, their, their level of confidence will definitely improve. So thank you for that. Um, beautifully presented. Just try and summarize how you are going to take the results of this study forward. Um, are you going to sh you know, share this with the uh, academic staff and the non-academic staff? Um, are you going to discuss with them how that can be improved? What is your plan for taking this forward, bearing in mind the outcomes of your study? Uh, so when we started uh, the study, uh, <coughs> we didn't expect such uh, differences. But as uh, the study progressed, we found there are some gaps that we can actually address. So we are actually planning to uh, find what can be done to improve uh, in both, like in terms of academic and university staff and non-university staff, and we are planning to uh, put it forward as well. So to improve, uh, basically, uh, what students can get from university staff as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shirukumar. Uh, so we will be moving on to, uh, with the next paper, oral presentation 33. May I invite uh, Dr. T. Sh T. Prashant to present the paper, please. Good morning. I am Dr. Prashant. Today I will be presenting our study on oncoplastic breast conserving surgery versus standard breast conserving surgery for early and locally advanced breast cancer. It is a four-year experience from two tertiary care units in Sri Lanka. Breast conserving surgery is recommended surgical strategy for operable breast cancer. It has two types, standard and oncoplastic type. If you consider a standard breast conserving surgery, which is white local excision, while obeying the principle of oncology. If you look into the oncoplastic breast conserving surgery, where we do the white local excision with the integration of reconstructive technique to increase the aesthetic outcomes. Studies have shown the poor cosmetic outcomes are generally attributed to affect around 30% of patients undergoing standard breast conserving surgery. So our study compared to assess the oncosurgical and aesthetic outcome of oncoplastic versus standard breast conserving surgery. We also moved to com compare the aesthetic outcome between the different levels of oncoplastic breast conserving surgeries. It is a retrospective cohort study done over a four-year period. Here the patient who underwent breast conserving surgery for primary non-metastatic breast cancer was included into the study. We assessed the oncosurgical outcome with 
resection rates, resection margins, complications. The surgical complications were categorized according to Clavian Dindo classification. And the aesthetic outcome was assessed through the Likert scale questionnaire to great specific outcome, including symmetry, volume, nipple position, and the scar visibility. An independent assessor was used for the assessment. The statistical analysis was performed with SPSS statistical software. The non-parametric tests were used for statistical analysis. The baseline comparison between the oncoplastic and standard resection groups were performed using chi-squared tests. The medians of continual variables were compared using mad with new and kruskal wallis test. If you look into the characteristic of patients, nearly 54 patients with a median age group of 56 were included in standard R, and 73 patients with a median age group of 51 was included in the oncoplastic R. If we consider the tumor size, the tumor size was fairly large in the oncoplastic R, and which was statistically significant. All the patients with a multifocal disease underwent on the oncoplastic breast conserving surgery. And the special thing is that all the tumors was located, most of the tumors were located in the upper outer quarter in both arms. And if we consider the characteristic of surgical treatment, if you consider the high median specimen volume and wider closest resection margin and re-excision rates, especially low re-excision rates were observed in oncoplastic arm when comparing with the standard arm, and it showed statistical significance. When we move on to compare the operative time between the standard versus oncoplastic arm, that didn't show any statistical significance. The only complication we observed during our study was the wound decision that was categorized under Clavian Dindo 3A. When we compare the median values of aesthetic outcomes, as clearly shown, the oncoplastic arm showed superior aesthetic outcome comparing with standard arm, and it was statistically significant. And we move on to compare the aesthetic outcome between the level one and level two oncoplastic breast conserving surgery. And we didn't find any statistical significance between the level one and level two in aesthetic outcome. But we had a special information that in pedicle based flaps had superior aesthetic outcome in all aspects. Then we categorized our patient into younger age and the older age group according to the age threshold definition by United Nations. And we compared the type of surgery we they underwent. And especially in younger age group, nearly 62% of patients underwent oncoplastic surgery. When comparing with the older age group, only 38% underwent oncoplastic surgery. When we see the box plot, is comparing the aesthetic outcome with in relation to the age and surgery. As obviously seen, in both groups, old and younger age group, the aesthetic outcomes are superior and showing statistical significance. And this is one of the study done in Sri Lanka with different socio-cultural background, even though there were many studies in Western country. So we draw a few conclusions, like re-resection rates were significantly lower in oncoplastic arm. No significant difference in operative time and complication between two arms. The aesthetic outcome is significantly superior in oncoplastic arm. And the pedicle based flap has superior aesthetic outcome. So we recommend oncoplastic breast conserving surgery is a safe and more aesthetically acceptable with no different in oncological outcome and operative time. More preference should be given to practice oncoplastic breast surgery when indicated. Our study had following limitations. Breast to tumor volume and the effect of adjuvant therapy on breast conserving surgery was not analyzed. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Prashantan. The paper is open for discussion. Any questions please? Who determines, thank you for the presentation, yeah, very nicely presented. Yeah. Who determined whether they were going to have an oncoplastic breast conserving surgery or standard? And how was that determination made in your study? Yeah, the thing is, this is decided by the consultant. 
mainly depending on the volume, but in experience, because we didn't consider the tumor volume ratio in your study, sir, because it was a retrospective study. But the decision was made based on their experience whether it can be gone for the uh, breast cancer standard surgery or the oncoplastic surgery with the level of uh, tumor site size which were decided by the con experience consultants. And so one assumes from your data, therefore, that everyone should have an oncoplastic breast reconstruction then? Yeah, if the patient is suitable for oncoplastic, because if the, if the patient has a tube, breast tissue loss less than 10%, sir, we don't have much aesthetic, poor aesthetic outcome. So in that case, we can comfortably proceed with a standard type. In 10 to 20 percent, there is a gray area, sir. So it has to be decided by the consultant whether to go for oncoplastic or breast conservation, considering the tumor type, volume, and the location. More than 20 percent, so we prefer to go towards the oncoplastic to reduce the aesthetic outcomes, to get the proper aesthetic outcome. Okay, thank you. Patients who could have uh, both the option, have you all had a discussion with the patient and was it given to the patient to make a decision? Yeah, usually we give the options to the patient. We explain what, what the advantages, what is the outcome advantages, everything will be explained to patient. Then patient takes the decision to select which arms. So why don't you <coughs> make the conclusion that uh, the way you selected patients for uh, standard operation was inappropriate. Now, why don't you make the conclusion uh, that the formula or whatever, the experience yes. that made you select the standard procedure had been inappropriate. That is why your outcomes have been uh, different. Because you said uh, there is a portion of patients yes. who will benefit, uh, who will be, uh, who will have good outcomes even with standard procedures yes so if, uh, while doing sir we are deciding we can the patient can go to the standard procedure but uh, after post surgically some patients show the poor cosmetic outcomes so uh, some outcomes are little bit deviating from our study sir. that's why we couldn't properly comment about that thank you very much uh, dr prasanthan uh, for that presentation thank, thank you I call upon the next speaker, uh, Dr. Hirusha Gunavardhana. Dr. Hirusha will be presenting OP2, microablation of liver tumors. Good morning. I am Hirusha Gunavardhana. I am an intern medical officer from uh, Ragama Teaching Hospital. Uh, our research title is uh, Immediate Outcome of Microwave Ablation for Liver Tumors in a single cohort of patients in Sri Lanka. Microwave ablation is an emerging treatment modality uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma and other primary and secondary liver tumor treatment in the world. But it is a relatively a newer technique for managing liver tumors in Sri Lanka. So we aim to assess the immediate success and complications of this procedure in our setting. We conducted a retrospective descriptive study, including four centers, Colombo North Teaching Hospital, Ragama, and three uh, private hospitals, Durden's, Navaloka, and uh, Lanka Hospital, Colombo. Uh, the study population included the patients underwent microwave ablation for the first time as the, treat, as the primary treatment modality for their liver tumor. The data collection was done using an interview administered questionnaire, and the data processing analysis was done using SPSS version 26. Uh, microwave ablation was performed under the ultrasound guidance in the percutaneous route in all these patients using uh, ECHO 100E microwave therapeutic system machine under the ultrasound machine, uh, uh, Minre Reson R9 in all these patients. And all the patients underwent a follow-up at two weeks to assess the complications, and at six weeks to assess the response to treatment using either CECT or MRI liver. Uh, our study population included 55 patients, and uh, median age was 64. The majority were males. Uh, all those patients were having hepatocellular carcinoma in a cirrhotic background, except for one patient who was having a secondary deposit from a colorectal carcinoma. The median tumor diameter was 28 millimeters, and the mean post-procedural hospital stay was 12 hours. 
This illustrates how burdened each liver segment with hepatocellular carcinoma in our population. You can see that the right lobe is more burdened with liver tumors than the left lobe. And the highest burden segments were segments 7 and 8. This illustrates the tumor characteristics with the ablation rates. You can identify that uh, tumor stage T1A tumors were having 100% completion complete success rate and in T2 and T1B tumors the success rate was low and the tumors larger than 40 millimeters were having 0% success. So the smaller tumors were having a higher success rate. So the primary outcome in our population 84% had complete ablation, only 7 patients, only 13% had residual lesions and 2 patients defaulted the follow-up. The segment-wise success rate was highest in the segment 6, maybe because of the easy access to segment 6 under the ultrasound guidance because of its location. And in the CTCT images, in A, in image A, you can see the uh, findings before the ablation with uh, arterial phase enhancement, which is characteristic of hepatocellular carcinoma. And after the ablation, the arterial phase enhancement is no longer there, which shows that there is complete ablation. Uh, regarding the complications, the mainly reported complication was post-ablation syndrome, which is defined as the presence of fever, abdominal pain, or nausea or vomiting within the immediate first five days after the procedure, which is not attributable for any other cause. So it was reported only in 16.4% of patients in our study group. So in conclusion, uh, in our setting also, there is 83% success rate in this microablation, which is a newer technique. In international literature, it is around 95 to 97%. In our population, no major complications were reported. And post-ablation syndrome was the mainly reported complication. And it is also not reported as commonly as in the literature. And so we can conclude that uh, microwave ablation is a successful and a safe treatment option for treating uh, primary liver tumors, even in a uh, Sri Lankan setting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hirusha. The paper is open for postcards. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another lovely presentation and very good results. Uh, I guess the learning points, um, the large tumors are more challenging and in our own institution, anything above four centimeters would very rarely go for microwave ablation. Um, you had some tumors up to eight centimeters, 80 millimeters. Uh, do, you, do you think it's down to selection criteria um, that would improve your results further? And the second part to that, e even though there's residual tumor viability seen at six weeks, you could still do another ablation session. It's one of the reasons for doing an early follow-up scan so that you can go back and do a, a further treatment session. Has that been done with the seven who had residual tumor? Yeah, the, uh, with regard to the size selection, actually the, uh, the smaller tumors were having the better success. So uh, we should uh, select only the small, uh, less than three centimeter size tumors should be selected for ablation techniques and we have to uh, go for other treatments like surgery for the larger tumors. And in regard to the six weeks follow-up, in the uh, we have un underwent the six weeks follow-up because uh, before the six weeks, it's not it was not possible to detect the response properly uh, with regard to the ablation. So that's why we have uh, underwent the imaging after six weeks. And uh, we can improve our study by uh, 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 doing follow-up imaging even later to do for any recurrences of the tumors. Thank you. I don't treat liver tumors, so forgive me for my ignorance of, of the question, um, but what are the longer-term outcomes from this treatment? You must have followed these um, this cohort of patients out for longer than six weeks now. I was just interested to know what the outcomes are in the longer term. Uh, in the longer term, uh, also, the, as uh, the most of these patients were having a hepatocellular carcinoma, even though the 
complete ablation rate was high, uh, there are many cases, the, the recurrence rate is high, which is not, uh, which, which is beyond the, court, uh, the scope of this study. The recurrence there's a uh, recurrence, there's a high recurrence rate, but we may need to do further research to compare it with the recurrence after ablation and to compare the long-term outcome with regard to the uh, recurrence after ablation and recurrence after surgery, we need further studies. Thank you very much, Dr. Hirusha, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me call upon our next uh, presenter, Dr. B.S.C. Kure, to present the paper on solid papillary tumor pancreas. Good morning, everyone. Let me present our study on solid pseudopapillary tumors of the pancreas, a single unit experience of an uncommon pancreatic tumor. So if you look at solid pseudopapillary tumors of the pancreas, they are rare exocrine pancreatic tumors amounting to about 1 to 2 percent of pancreatic tumors with an unknown pathogenesis. This is predominantly seen in young females in the second to third decade of their life, and they're often asymptomatic, therefore in mostly detected incidentally. They have a very low malignant potential, therefore complete surgical resection of the tumor is the treatment of choice and shows excellent prognosis. However, being a rare neoplasm, the existing data on patient characteristics and survival of patients with solid seropatory tumors is very limited, especially in Sri Lankan setting. Therefore, our objective was to describe the characteristics and survival of patients of solid, with solid pseudopapillary tumors of the pancreas on data collected prospectively in a dedicated tertiary referral center in Sri Lanka. The study was done at Colombo North Center for Liver Diseases, which has a dedicated hepatopancreatic or biliary center from 2011 to June 2022. The patients were referred to our center uh, from their initial uh, symptoms or due to their in initial imaging studies. And the diagnosis of solid pseudopapillary tumors were based on the CT and MRI imaging characteristics, which was discussed through a multidisciplinary team. Tumor biopsy was not done part of, as part of the workup. However, once the diagnosis was made, the decision for future management was also made through a multidisciplinary team. For the tumors in the head of the pancreas, a Whipple's procedure was planned. And for the tumors in the distal pancreas, was, uh, a uh, distal pancreatectomy was planned, and for surface lesions away from the main duct, local resection was planned. This way, 14 patients were diagnosed with solid pseudopapillary tumors, and prospective data was collected pre- and perioperatively on clinic visits and hospital admissions, and then post-operative data was collected one week after the surgery, and then every three months with ultrasound scans for three years. The data was collected on patient demographic characteristics, clinical presentation, radiological findings of the tumor, surgical management and perioperative details, and post-operative follow-up for recurrences. So if you look at our results in our uh, cohort of 14 patients, there was a female preponderance of 93% with a mean age of 30.4 years and standard deviation of 10.69. A majority of 36% of these patients presented with a very non-significant uh, non abdominal pain. And if you look at our imaging studies, uh, ultrasound scan was done on eight patients prior to referral to our center, and the median tumor diameter detected on the ultrasound detected lesions was 5.5 centimeters with a range of 4 to 18. And CT abdomen, abdomen was done on all 14 patients, which showed a median tumor diameter of 7.10 centimeters with a range of 3 to 18. Only one patient had liver metastasis at presentation. And for the purpose of our study, we uh, analyzed these data according to uh, the location of the tumor of this, uh, on CT scan with relation to the portal vein, which showed uh, that a majority of 64% the tumor was located to the left of the portal vein, while only 36% had the tumor located to the right of the portal vein. All 14 patients underwent surg surgical management, uh, and 43% underwent a distal pancreatectomy plus splenectomy, while another 43% underwent a whipus procedure, and only 7.1% e each underwent a total pancreatectomy plus splenectomy and a local resection. And they had a mean hospital stay of 7.6 days with standard deviation of 1.98, and a mean ICU stay of 2.7 days with a standard deviation of 0.99. A majority of 71.4% of these patients had an uncomplicated post-operative com period with only minor post-operative complications seen in 21.4% of the patients and intra-abdominal infection in 7.1% of the patients. There were no surgical mortalities. And the if you look at the histological findings, 
patients were, uh, had a clear resection margin with only one patient having a uh, resection margin of less than one millimeter, and there were no lymphovascular invasions, and the median tumor diameter of the resected specimen was around 8.5 centimeters with a range of 3.5 to 18. And if you look at the location of these resected specimens and, the median tumor of the, and their median tumor di diameters, the tumors to the left of the portal vein were larger with a median tumor diameter of 10.25 centimeters with a range of 4 to 18. And to the right of the portal vein, the median tumor diameter was around 5.2 centimeters with a range of 4 to 8. The surface lesion was around 3.5 centimeters. So at a median follow-up of 22 months, there were no recurrences, giving a median recurrence fee survival and a median overall survival of 22 months. So, in conclusion, in our cohort, solid seed papillary tumors of the pancreas were seen in young females who had excellent survival after surgical resection, and the involvement of the head and the body of the pancreas was common compared to the involvement of the tail in available literature. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kure. And uh, we can accommodate a few questions from the audience, please. Yes. Dr. Uh, congratulations on a very nice paper uh, with excellent results, really, they... Uh, morbidity rate was remarkably low, so, so congratulations on those. I, I guess I have two questions, if I may. First, was uh, or any of the cases diagnosed preoperatively, or were all of these patients diagnosed with uh, pseudopapillary tumour on histological grounds, in other words, postoperatively? That's the first question. My second question is, why do you follow them up with three monthly ultrasound scans? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as the first uh, answer for the first question, uh, tumor biopsy was not actually part of our initial workup. Uh, we mainly diagnosed these patients based on the CT and MRI findings, and uh, the histological diagnosis was done postoperatively with the resected specimens. And uh, we followed up them, uh, followed them up with ultrasound scans, uh, mainly to detect any recurrences of these tumors, and uh, based on the previous literature and looking at the recurrence rates and uh, everything, we uh, detect, uh, decided that uh, a three-monthly interval was an uh, uh, adequate interval to uh, look for these recurrences, and we followed them up to three years. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think the literature would suggest that recurrence is very, very uncommon, and ultrasound generally isn't a good method to identify re recurrence. But, yes, uh, it's a, yeah. it's a very, it has very low recurrence rates. Very, very low recurrence rate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to follow that up, yes. um, and I enjoyed your presentation with excellent results, what, what intervention are you likely to use if you did find anything abnormal on your ultrasound or even a CT? Um, sorry, sir? Yeah, on a follow-up? What, what find... intervention are you going to do if you see some abnormality on mm -hmm. the ultrasound that you're arranging every three months? Uh, or even if you did a CT scan, if mm -hmm. you found it, are you going to reoperate? Uh, actually, uh, since this is a, a cancer, a malignancy with very low malignant potential, uh, uh, going back for another surgery would be uh, an uh, unnecessary intervention of sorts. However, we would like to follow it up for any uh, new changes or increase in size, uh, causing uh, indicating us for a need for another surgery, and. Uh, further histological uh, uh, follow-up when necessary. So how often is uh, repeat surgery um, see, done in this particular tumour? Is uh, that common? Not very common, sir, because it has very low malignant potential and even... Uh... Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, you said there was one patient with the liver metastasis. Yes, sir. Can you, do you have the data to say what was the follow-up of that patient, that individual follow-up? Yes, uh, so for that patient, uh, uh, we did a liver metastatectomy as well. And uh, even him, in him, there was, uh, in, uh, in that patient, there was uh, 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 no recurrences that we could no, I'm asking the duration of the follow-up of that patient. You said your follow-up ranges from three months to seven years. Yes. Sir. So was it just three months or seven years? Uh, I, I'm, I cannot exactly okay. recall the duration. Thank so. you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Kuri, thank you for your presentation. And that will wind up the free paper session. Uh, on behalf of the college, <laughs> let me thank our eminent panel of judges, Professor Mike Griffin, Professor Owen Parks, and Dr. Anurudha Begunasekara, and also all the presenters for their excellent work. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, allow me to make a kind uh, 
uh, notification. We are about to start the uh, most important session of the morning, uh, session of day two of the Sri Lanka Surgical Congress 2022. The SARC oration is about to be commenced. May I kindly request you to please rise from your seats as the President, the Council and the orator will be entering into the hall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may take your seats. Sir. <clears throat> to, to introduce the orator of the prestigious SARC oration, may I kindly invite on stage sir, Professor Srinivas Chandrasekhar to introduce the orator. Uh, and the Good morning. Uh, for the SARC oration, um, uh, it will be delivered by Pro Pro uh, Dr. T.G. Amal Priyanta. I invite Professor Ajit Aloka Patirana to read the citation. Good morning, members of the head table, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce you to you the SARC Orator of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for the year 2022, Dr. Tambavita Guru Nan Selage Amal Priyanta. He had his primary and secondary education at the prestigious Mahinda College in Gaul and entered the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Ruhuna, from which he graduated in 1986. He obtained the Master of Surgery from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo in 1993, and was subsequently board certified as a specialist in gastrointestinal surgery. His initial training in GI surgery was at the National Hospital, Sri Lanka, in 1994, under late Professor Dayasri Fernando. Amal had his overseas training in Australia at Westmead Hospital, Sydney in 1996. To further his training in gastroenterological surgery, he received the Japanese Society of Gastroenterological Surgery Fellowship to train in GI surgery at the Kyoto Prefectural Hospital, Japan, and later underwent training in early detection of GI cancers at Keio University Hospital in Japan. Upon completion, of his PG training and board certification, he was appointed as the first gastroenterological surgeon at the teaching hospital Candy, where he established a GI surgery center with a fully equipped endoscope unit. Subsequently, he was appointed to Colombo South Teaching Hospital, where he's, he has remained until now. Dr. Amal Priyanta was keen to improve the quality of training in GI surgery and was involved with the PGIM throughout his career. Currently, he is the chairman of the subspecialty board in gastrointestinal surgery and is also a member of the board of study in surgery. He has been an examiner in both undergraduate and postgraduate surgical examinations for the last two decades. At an international level, he has contributed as a council member of the Asia Pacific Society of Digestive Endoscopy and the Asia Pacific Association of Gastroenterology and is also a member of the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. Amal has been diligently keeping records of all the patients he operates and manages a large database. He is one of the few surgeons who is not attached to a university, having a keen interest in research, and has around 20 publications to his name and more than 50 oral presentations at scientific meetings. Having a comprehensive database of surgeries performed, 
helped him to deliver two orations, the Candy Society of Medicine oration in 2013 on minimal access surgery, the way forward, and the Bartholomew's oration 2016 on surgery for colorectal cancer in Sri Lanka, open to laparoscopy. Probably more important than his academic contributions is the service he has rendered to the society in general, and as a dedicated and humane surgeon to scores of patients in Sri Lanka. He has a wide repertoire of surgical expertise, both open and laparoscopic, involving the entire GI tract, and is also an expert therapeutic endoscopist. I have had the privilege of working with Dr. Amal Priyanta since 1991. He was the registrar in surgery to Dr. M. S. Sivam during my internship, and my senior registrar in surgery to, at, uh, with Professor Dasari Fernando during my training as a registrar. I have known him to be an extremely hardworking, all person who is always willing to learn and committed to his work. He was loved by his peers and supervisors. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to have had the opportunity to de deliver the citation of Dr. Amal Priyanta, the Sark Surgical Society Orator 2022 of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Aloka Patirata, for this generous introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the President and Council of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for giving me this opportunity. An estimated uh, 1.8 billion new cases are being diagnosed all over the world with colorectal cancer. And it accounts for 860 deaths all over the world each year. In Sri Lanka, we diagnose about 800 cases annually and accounts for 7% of all malignancies. The aims of this study was to assess the results of laparoscopic surgery for colorectal cancer in our center, compare with published results, and try and establish a benchmark. At the same time, I will be highlighting the need for standardized reporting. The first laparoscopic colorectal cancer resection was carried out by Jacobs in 1991. However, two years later, there was a wound recurrent, report of wound recurrent, and everybody was very skeptical, and laparoscopic surgery suffered a major setback. In 2002, the famous four randomized control trials published their results, and they showed laparoscopic surgery is very safe, in fact, superior. So we carried out, out our first laparoscopic colorectal resection in Candy, when I was in Candy, in 2008. Uh, in 2013, I moved to the present station, teaching hospital Colombo South, and what you are going to see here today are the cases I perform in this institution. A benchmark is referred as a point of reference by which something can be measured. So this will lead to improvement of uh, the treatment of colorectal cancer in Sri Lanka, improvement of results of the treatment, and therefore increase the results and benefit materials and methods. The collection of data, almost all my personal data. However, I had to depend on hospital records, especially for uh, uh, pathological reports. Unfortunately, it is not very consistent. So the statistical analysis, the categorical data are presented as percentages, quantitative data as median and standard division, and the survival data and survival analysis was performed by Kaplan method, and the differences were compared with Lograng or mental Cox text. The preoperative management was pretty standard. Histological confirmation, colonoscopic assessment, staging with CT scan. And the patient's fitness was assessed this most often with ASA and sometimes malampathy classification. The decision regarding the neoadjuvant therapy was taken after consultation with other specialties, especially oncologists, and when we gave chemotherapy or neoadjuvant therapy, we wait for six to eight weeks before taking up for surgery. When obtaining written consent, special reference was made to the possible conversions as well as the formation of stoma. We use enhanced recovery protocol with some modification for our convenience. Positioning, again, depending on the uh, location of the lesion, for left, left side and rectal lesion, we use modified uh, lithotomy tendonberg with steep head down and left uh, uh, right tilt. So pneumoperitoneum, most of the time with varus needle, especially in virgin abdomen, and sometimes open. Please 
used standard four ports, one suprambical camera port, two on the right side, one, one on the left side. Definition of the access. The total laparoscopic procedure was defined as where entire procedure was carried out laparoscopically, except intracorporeal anastomosis, which we don't do. An incision was made only to extract the specimen, and the anastomosis was also, also carried out using the same length of incision. A conversion was defined as an instance where the incision was used was longer or different to what was planned. Surgical technique. Mobilization of the, sorry, mobilization of the colon was always uh, uh, medial to lateral, and it's very important to take the proper plane. Uh, so this is uh, intravascular pain being developed, and you will notice the ureter on uh, white structure on top uh, of this uh, picture. And in the case of rectal cancers, either the total mesorectal excision or the tumor-specific mesorectal excision was carried out, depending on the location of the lesion. We always carried out uh, the D2 lymph node dissection as uh, shown in Japanese uh, guidelines. Unfortunately, these are a fairly old guidelines which I brought from Japan. And so these, the IMA is being clipped. Uh, it was rectal anosomosis was always double stapling techniques and sometimes for right, after right hemoglobin, we employed hand anastomosis. The protective loop pileostomy, the decision was taken after considering the risk factors. So at the time of discharge, patients were given a follow-up plan, irrespective of whether they come or not. So at the follow-up, clinical assessment was made, an annual colonoscopy was done, and screened for a metastasis. And CEA was not done routinely because it cost about 8,000 rupees. Uh, most of the people find it difficult to afford. And uh, in a small cohort of studies, we looked at their quality of life after anti-resection, and we used the standard questionnaires for that. Results. The study period was 2013 to 2022 May until the submission of this paper. However, we did four, five more cases, one open, uh, four laparoscopic, so I included them for the final analysis. So, so our study population of 171, out of which 120 underwent laparoscopic resection. So mean age of a patient was 61 years. There were 61 females and 52 females. There was some familial uh, tendency also, 8% of family, uh, uh, patients having uh, first degree relatives. And there were four patients with uh, familial adenomatous poly polyposis, and I, obviously they were late presentations. And the rest can be regarded as sporadic. So the most of the, the looking at the cancer distribution, most of, this, of these cancers were located on the rectum and sigmoid region. So this has a wide implication when it comes to screening, so I'll be discussing it later. later shortly. Looking at the stage of presentation, most of the tumors at either stage 2 or 3. And fortunately, we were having ASA 1 or 2 patients in our study. So these are the procedures we carried out, mostly anterior resection and sigmoid colectomy, and sub, some APR, and obviously for uh, proctocolectomy for late presentation. Sometimes we had to carry out combined organ resection, especially when uh, they are involved. So the most com uh, uh, usually uh, resected organ was the ureter. You can see the ureter be being uh, resected. And we usually uh, suture it laparoscopically, unless, of course, the ureter is involved, where it is definitely a uh, conversion. So liver, we have resected liver, uterus, and uh, left adrenal all laparoscopically. However, this left adrenal uh, patient actually had a, uh, adenoma. We initially thought it's a metastasis. Sorry. So there were four conversions, and our uh, anterior resections to APR ratio was one, 10 to 1. Blood losses, uh, the shortest uh, uh, minimum blood loss was recorded for sigmoid colectomy, and uh, some of our proctocolectomy also recorded lower blood pressures, and highest uh, also for uh, uh, proctocolectomy. And same thing in the uh, operative uh, time, shortest for sigmoid colectomy and highest for uh, 
uh, proctocolectomy. These are long operation, taking more than six hours. So our mean hospital stay was 5.5 days. There were 27 uh, complications, first off. There were re-explorations to and re two readmission and single mortality. So most of our complications were due to uh, wound infection and few prolonged ileus. There, there are two other complications which I thought I must mention because of their serious in nature. One patient developed rectovaginal fistula. This is after uh, low AR, one of our first patients. She was very fat female with uh, android pelvis and low tumor. And most likely, uh, the posterior vaginal wall caught in the stapler. And one patient with cirrhosis, child A, developed spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is our last patient. The, uh, the, uh, we carried out laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy, and the surgery was uneventful. Blood loss was minimal, about 30, 40 cc. However, he became decompensated and developed bacterial peritonitis. However, we managed along the usual line. Nothing happened. Only thing is post-operative uh, uh, stay was about eight days. So looking at the uh, oncological clearance, 98% had uh, distal resection margin negative. Circumferential margin were negative in 90, almost 95%. And our lymph node harvest, uh, uh, the mean was 10.7. So we followed up 80 patients up to 24 months. And the most uh, common uh, long-term complication was incisional hernia developing at the site of uh, closure of the ileostomy. And there was one local recurrence uh, and five metastases, most of them into the liver. There were four deaths, two of them related to death uh, disease, others were not related. The survival analysis, the overall crude survival was 75 percent, overall uh, disease specific survival was 80 percent, and the disease free survival was 72 percent. So uh, quality assurance, we uh, analyzed first uh, 43 patients, unfortunately only 16 were available for the study because uh, some were not contactable, some were still having ileostomy and few dots also. Out of the 10, uh, that uh, 16 that were available, 10 had major low anterior resection syndrome after 22 months follow-up. So when we compared the lower rectal against uh, upper rectal, there is no difference. That means the rectal volume per se is not the uh, causative for factor for this disease. Discussion. So looking at uh, the age, mean age, uh, almost comparable with published data. Similarly, similar trend in the female, male to female uh, ratio, not much of a difference. However, we had higher uh, proportion of ASA1 patients. So uh, etiology, not much of a difference from published data, a few familial adenopetrosis and few uh, family history. Rest were sporadic. Tumor location, we notice most of our uh, uh, most of our other studies have reported higher incidence of right colon cancer. In our study, it was lower. And in this study, uh, I have noticed uh, they have published this uh, lump together, the sigmoid colon and rectum lump together, which I think has to be separated because they behave they have behavior yeah, is separate, and their incidence, as we you see will, uh, later, they are di different. So most of our patients had. Uh, rectal sigmoid, rect sigmoid or rectal cancers. So that means ideal for uh, screening with flexible sigmoidoscopy. So these, they, these are uh, four major uh, trials and they examine the use of flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, in screening of colorectal cancer. And very recently they have done a meta-analysis on these four studies and showed that the mortality following colorectal cancer can be reduced as much as 20% if you employ flexible sigmoidoscopy alone as a mode of uh, screening. Stage at presentation, the lack of screening is already apparent. We had only one uh, stage one tumor, whereas in other studies it's about 14%. The stage four patients all usually or exclusively presented with liver metastasis, and though it looks a little uh, lower in our study. So the laparoscopic penetration rate is regarded as one of the health indicators in a country. So over the years, as you notice, uh, 
the both for colon and rectal cancer, the laparoscopic penetration has grown up and reached almost 90 percent. Correspondingly, open resection have come down. And these are actually uh, conversion, which I will deal with later. And our laparoscopic penetration was 74 percent. Uh, actually, we did laparoscopic only for the routine cases. We have excluded uh, the emergency, especially obstruction. So I don't know whether this figure will go up if you analyze only for uh, routine cases. So that's why I insist on standard reporting. The type of procedure, the, the manner in which we approach different uh, cancers as well as the reporting is different in separate in this uh, slide. Some people do not do or avoid transverse colon resection for transverse uh, colon lesion. That is maybe because it is technically dif difficult. And some others do transverse colectomy, nothing wrong with that. And we do uh, extended right hemicolectomy for such patients because we think we can do a safer anastomosis. And here, the large study, again, they have lumped sigmoid colectomy and anterior resection together. I think this has to be separated. And the same study, the APR ratio is fairly high. Whereas in our study, AR ratio is uh, very high and APR ratio is low. Obviously, we, di we uh, did do some uh, proctocolectomy because of our late presentation of FAP. So when you looked at the uh, sphincter uh, preservation, we have one of the highest ratios. Uh, despite that, we had only one local recurrence. Operating time, well, we are not the fastest surgeon, sorry. Uh, our, our operating time was always higher. This may be because we are a major cent, uh, training center. I allow some of my trainees to undertake uh, part of surg uh, the surgery or even sometimes under supervision entire procedure. Same story with the uh, subgroup analysis, except for the sigmoid colectomy, rest of the procedures have taken a longer duration. Similar trend can be seen in blood loss. Our blood losses are higher. There is no difference when you are do, do the subgroup analysis either. Anyway, uh, the blood losses and operating time does not have much of an uh, impact on the final outcome, but conversion do. Uh, for example, one of our patients was converted due to uh, uh, misfiring of the stapler. Subsequently, this patient had anastomosic leak and accounted for the only, only mortality in our study. So over the years, the conversion rates have come down and it stays at about eight, around 8%. And we have brought it down further for colon as well as rectal cancers. Post-operative complications, the mostly our, our post-op complications are little on the higher side, mainly because of our wound infection rate. So the other complications are more or less the same. So I mentioned about the rectovaginal fistula, and it has been recorded over the literature. Uh, way, to a varying degree. Now, this is a single study. This is a uh, meta-analysis, and this is a literature review. Though our uh, rate is very low, I think we have to avoid that complications altogether, because it's a very difficult complication to treat. Anastomotic leak, the surgeon's nightmare. So, uh, we have recorded one of the lowest anastomotic leak when you take entire uh, colorectal cancers. However, when you look at the subgroup analysis, we had zero uh, anastomotic leak for uh, colon cancer. Uh, very low anastomotic leak had been reported in two small studies, 1.5, 1.2. Uh, otherwise, meta according to meta analysis, it's about 6.6 .6 and sometimes zero to 3.3. .3, and we are not too bad in that sense. We had two anastomotic leak. Uh, one did not require re-exploration, when you minor in nature, and we just managed with antibiotics. Only one had re-exploration. So 30-day mortality, again, uh, zero mortality have been reported in some small studies. And this is a very excellent study uh, coming from Korea, Eight more than 800 cases. Still, mortality 0 0.5. Usually, uh, it's reported as uh, 1.7, that's meta-analysis, 1.7 for colon cancer and 1.1 for rectal cancer. So I was a bit surprised. I thought it's the other way around. Uh, anyway, our mortality was 0 0.8, I think, not too bad. 
the uh, post-operative hospital uh, stay, usually it's about five to six days, and ours was 5.5, and within the acceptable limits. The re-exploration. Re Unfortunately, most of the studies do not report re-exploration, but it is important to report because it has a uh, worse outcome uh, at the final results. So according to the uh, data that we have, we have the one of the lowest re-exploration rate, 1.6. Resection margins, again, 98% uh, negative, distal resection margin. Circumferential margin, almost 95% negative, and R0 resection, almost 93. Looking at the lymph node harvest, so when you looked at the lymph node harvest, it is not the same. Uh, we usually recorded lower lymph node harvest. Uh, uh, the, uh, that's for, for the overall cancers. However, we should not, I think I uh, stated this as a mean because for the ease of comparison. Otherwise, it has to be reported as like this, as a percentage, separately for colon and rectal cancer. Uh, actually, the standard is you must try to achieve two pedal plus node in 80% of the cases. That is in order to avoid what is called the mitigation effect or is also called the, uh, 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 some other name, I forget, sorry. Rogers, uh, Rogers phenomenon, sorry. So uh, then we look, went and looked at uh, uh, the subgroup analysis. Uh, we were pretty much all right when you look at the uh, colon cancers, but there was a deficiency when you look at the rectal cancer. So I was a little disappointed because uh, we take so much of uh, trouble in dissecting the uh, mesorectum very carefully, taking all the lymph nodes, still, our lymph node recurrence, uh, lymph node harvest was lower. So this article may provide the answer because surgeon is not, not the only person to blame. The pathologists have duty to look hard and they say it is one of the most unpleasant tasks in the pathological department to house the lymph nodes. So there are other factors, patient factors, as well as tumor factors. And one other important thing not being uh, uh, discussed here is the effect of neoadjuvant therapy on lymph node harvest. There are several reports. Now this study coming from none other than Harbour Gamma, and she goes on to say that if you employ neoadjuvant therapy, uh, 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 the lymph node harvest as a prognostic marker is not that significant. And in this study, she concluded that uh, lymph node harvest was zero in patients who were responded completely. So we went back and reanalyzed our results to see a similar trend. After neoadjuvant therapy, it was low. However, patient who did not receive, receive neoadjuvant therapy for various reasons, it was almost there. So we have to make up a little bit. I think the pathologist can help for that. So another important marker, complete responders. We had six of them. The question that I am asking is whether we should practice watch and wait policy for these patients. I think we should do because for two reasons. One, uh, uh, the laparoscopic anterior resection is a costly affair nowadays. I have calculated we use TA plus costing about 500 rupees. That's quite a large amount. So altogether about 3 million rupees for these six patients. Maybe not big amount when you consider our waste. Anyway, the second reason is that as you will see in the late, uh, next few slides, their quality of the life is not the same after anterior resection. The, our follow-up rate, uh, the period, uh, 2.7 uh, years. This is mainly because most of these cases were done uh, within last couple of years, few years. And local recurrence rate is 1.2, maybe go, may going up later, only one recurrence. Similarly, uh, distal metastasis also appear to be low, may, may be attributed to the lower uh, follow-up. We don't know. The survival analysis. The disease-free survival uh, looks a little lower. That is maybe because most of the recurrences occur within first two years. So by now, most of the recurrences would have been uh, appeared. Similar trend, uh, higher survival rate because up to five years, the patients can die. So this might come down later on. So it appears uh, high at the moment. So uh, no point doing heroic surgery unless we uh, improve patient's quality of the life, the compassionate surgery. 
So uh, we looked at the lower anterior section syndrome among our patients. So this is a syndrome characterized by disturbed bowel function, disturbed anorectal function, urinary dysfunction, and sexual dysfunction. And etiology is multifocal. Not only the rectal capacity, but other factors do uh, play a role. So reported incidence vary. In our study, the, it's about, about 62%. So that is why we have to think about organ preservation. Uh, before uh, I f uh, wind up, just look at uh, the future developments. There are two extensions to the laparoscopic surgery. One is the robotic surgery, which I am not going to discuss, given our economic situation. The other extension is the single incision laparoscopy. So we started with this big incision for colorectal cancers. Then came the laparoscopic uh, surgery, few small incisions. Still, we were not happy. We wanted to do it still uh, small. So that is the concept of a single incision laparoscopy. To do that, we need this gadget, a gel fort, which cost about 50,000 rupees, maybe more now. So we devised one with a rubber glove and rubber uh, bands. This costs only about few hundred rupees. And besides, much more greener. Uh, everything is biodegradable. So anyway, this is not my invention. It has been reported. They have noticed uh, lower uh, pain scores. Anyhow, this pay, uh, they have used another additional port to complete the anterior resection. This is our patient. We completed the entire anterior resection with this glove uh, apparatus. However, we required an additional port for a different reason. Because this patient had a liver metastasis on the right lobe. So we had to carry out the liver resection non-anatomical. And actually, it was done by my senior registrar, Dr. Buddhi Gauragada, and Dr. Prabhat. And this is the final results. So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying that we need a benchmark to uh, compare our results. I'm not saying this is a benchmark, can, but can be regarded as a starting point. So I think I have already shown up the, the, the need for standard format of reporting. Otherwise, it, it, when it comes to comparison, it's difficult to compare. So the time to show the gratitude. Uh, I have many people to thank because this is a teamwork. The nursing staff, especially OTB, they are very helpful. Uh, they work tirelessly, long operating hours. Thank you very much. And also the other nurses, ICU, endoscopy and ward for looking after my patients. My medical officers previous and present, I know how hard they work to look after my patients. And I have a wonderful team of consultant anesthetists led by uh, Asoka, Nilangani, Samita, uh, Priyani, and Anoma. And they make our life very much easier. And I wholeheartedly thank them and their uh, junior colleagues. And of course, directors of the hospital, previous director, Dr. Asay Lagunodhan, who is the DG now and also current director, Dr. Prasagari uh, Kiriwandenya. Thank you very much for all the support. So my uh, statistical analysis always I depend on Mahesh, uh, Dr. Mahesh Bandara. Thank you, Mahesh, for that. Uh, and uh, I always thank my guru, late Professor Dayasi Fernando, who is one of our past president and uh, one of the pioneering uh, colorectal surgeons. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, my, all my senior registrars, uh, most of them are consultants now, uh, GI surgeons in various places, uh, some still on the, in, in the training program. Rehan Gamege is in UK now, and he's the person who carried out this uh, low anterior resection syndrome study. Currently, uh, Dr. Buddhi Gauragada and Vibhuti is with me, and very talented guys. I'm sure they will uh, elevate the uh, research by of this. And, uh, sorry. Anyway, I must thank my family because I have spent more than 650 hours doing these cases, plus continuous, plus another 100 hours or so uh, writing this oration. So altogether about one month continuous. That is the time I took away from my family. So I uh, thank my wife, Tejini, uh, my son, Tharin, for bearing me up. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for gracing this occasion. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, uh, for the most uh, uh, insightful evidence-based uh, narrative of uh, laparoscopic colorectal surgery in Sri Lanka, uh, which will uh, lead towards benchmarking us in the global framework. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude uh, the SARC oration and the pre tea session. Um, may I kindly request you to arise from your seats as the orator. The president and the council shall now uh, leave the hall. <laughs>